Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. Go there in the scriptures, the authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures, the true and real scriptures. <clears throat> Jeremiah 5, verses 30 on to verse 31. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end then? <clears throat> Go to Jude. Go to Jude. Verses 3 on to verse 4. Jude verses 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. One and the same person, spirit, soul, and body. The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. <clears throat> Skip now to verse, verse 10 on to verse 13. Verses 10 on to verse 13 in Jude. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally. As brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. <laughs> These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Twice dead, the second death. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Skip over to, um, oh no, let's read now on to verse 19. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Okay, look at verse 15. One, two, three, four. Four times the word ungodly is there. Yeah. Verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. Now between you and I, beloved brethren, sisters, you ask me, 
That is probably one of the best scriptural definitions of a Jesuit that you're ever going to get. Ah, green tea and honey, of course. <clears throat> now in the previous video, I hope you watched the first video to this. We go through the scriptures and show you, and we see, that as the Church of the Living God, we are to adhere to the Scriptures. The Scriptures are our final authority. We are to live by the Scriptures according to faith and practice. And we also saw in the previous video how that the Lord does not want us to openly be against government. Openly. Unless that government puts into a law something that is totally contrary to the scriptures, our standard as the Church of the Living God. Okay? Then, then we as the Church of the Living God are obligated to stand against it and to fight it. Okay? Uh, that I proved that in the... Uh, video before this one, okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ, for example, our Father, if, let's say, that you of the Church of the Living God got into a political office, go with it. Our Lord, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, would have you, as the Church of the Living God, as ministers of reconciliation to balance and to adhere your term or whatever in accordance with the scriptures okay and to obey the laws and you see that in Romans chapter 13 that if you were of the church of the living God and say you were elected to a mayor okay you were to apply in the uh, from the Pauline epistles doctrine specifically written for us today in the time of the Gentiles, you would to uh, adhere your uh, term of office in accordance with, say, Romans chapter 13. Okay? Okay? Our Lord would have us to obey just government, righteous government that at least adheres to some principles at least founded upon scripture okay but when governments make laws that are totally contrary to the scriptures we as the church of the living God are obligated to stand against them and to fight against them absolutely absolutely Okay, we are not to be rebellious against government because the government is there for the punishment of evil doers. Okay, do we get that? Yeah, and we go through all the scriptures in the first video. It's important that you watch the first video. We, as the Church of the Living God, we are bound to give glory unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and to adhere and live by faith and practice the scriptures, the authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures, the true and real scriptures. Here it is. This is what we fashion our life after. The doctrine found in the Pauline epistles, especially for today, in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. Okay, do we get that? We are loyal unto the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and died for us on the cross who shed his blood to make an atonement for your sin and for my sin. And he, according to his word, would have us if, say, you got into a political office or something like that, would to be follow the scriptures and to obey 
the righteous laws that are there. And who decides what laws are good and which ones are not? The scriptures. See, the scriptures. The scriptures. A true member of the Church of the Living God would fight for the nation for and what and where he or she lives. But the question comes up, what happens when that nation is totally against the Lord? Well then, <clears throat> you abide still by the scriptures and let come what will come, no matter the cost. We Again, brethren, Church of the Living God, this is our standard. You say that, but do you really do it? I strive to every day. But now imagine a people. Now, when I say people, I don't mean a kindred. I mean a people whose sole loyalty is to a man who they think is God, who they are trained to see as God, and is nothing of the sort. Whose loyalty is to a church, a system, and inevitably to a man who will be calling himself God, but in fact he will be Antichrist. Imagine a people, no matter, let's say the, let's say for example, go with me, that here in America that <laughs> America was a godly nation. Just go with me, okay? Imagine a people who would purposely, in a godly nation, would do everything contrary to the scripture because the head of their order told them to do so. The Jesuit, the Catholic, is taught to be loyal to the Pope. And the Pope is Antichrist. Francis is not the Antichrist, and Sosa is not the Antichrist, but they are Antichrist. <clears throat> Absolutely. And the Catholic, if their Pope says something, remember, because the Pope is the Vicar of Christ, he is God on earth. And if the Pope says something that is contrary to the Scripture, then the Catholic i.e. the Jesuit, obeys the Pope, not the Scripture. Whereas the Church of the Living God, we obey the Scriptures. Jesuits, Catholics, one and the same, are from their inception taught disloyalty. And we're going to prove that to you today. This is another big video. Here are going to be the resources that I'm going to be using in this video. The Catholic Bible. Okay? Catechism of the Catholic Church. Incidentally, uh, to the one brother, beloved brother, who recommended putting this in my uh, links on my channel. Uh, I don't want to do that, brother. Um, I, I'm sorry. I don't want to do that. Um, uh, Brother Matthew Hroon, he left a link for it, and, um, you know, I can copy that link and put it in the comment, but I don't want to put that in the, uh, um, links on my channel. But, we're going to use the Catholic Bible. Also, another resource that we're going to be looking through is this, Edmund Paris, The Secret History of the Jesuits. Also, another book that we're going to look some stuff up in is this book. See that? I got this off of Amazon. Um, this is a very good book. Uh, this has the Secreto Monita in it. This has the Syllabus of Errors in it and portions from Chenicle's uh, uh, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. And we are also going to be 
reading some a whole chapter out of this book, The Black Pope. Um, I highly recommend to you, Church of the Living God, to get this book. I recommend virtually all these for your own personal study of the Jesuit order. Uh, I don't really recommend this, but then again, it is good to know your enemy. Okay? But this is uh, these are the resources we're going to be looking at today. And, uh, Lord willing, you're going to see that the Catholic Church teaches disloyalty to God and country, but rather teaches loyalty to the Pope, who is Antichrist, who calls himself the Vicar of Christ. So, with that, going to be reading now. I have the uh, PDF for this on my channel. Why the PDF has less ch uh, pages than this book does, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. But what we're going to be looking at in this is available on the PDF on my channel. Okay? So, if you can, get a hold of this and download it. We are going to be reading chapter 3, the founding of the company of the Jesuits, and also chapter 4 of the spirit of the order. Okay? So now, you can download this on my channel. Please do so. But, this is what I'm going to be reading you. Pause it and read it. Take a screenshot and zoom in. And also, this right here. Take a screenshot, pause it, and zoom in. I'm going to get my face out of it. And then... Pause it, read it, take a screenshot, zoom in. And finally, this page. Pause it, read it, take a screenshot, zoom in. Okay? The Secret History of the Jesuits, Chapter 3, Founding of the Company. The Society of Jesus was constituted on Assumption Day in 1534 in the chapel of Notre Dame, our mother, Notre Dame de, de Montmartre. Ignatius was then 44 years old. After communion, the animator and his companions vowed to go to the Holy Land as soon as their studies were finished to convert infidels. The following year, then in Rome, where the Pope, who was then organizing a crusade against the Turks with the German Emperor and the Republic of Venice, showed them how impossible their project was because of it. So Ignatius and his companions de dedicated themselves to missionary work in Christian lands. In Venice, his apostolate roused again the suspicions of the Inquisition. The constitution of the Company of Jesus was at last drafted and approved in Rome by Paul III in 1540 and the Jesuits put themselves at the disposition of the Pope, promising him unconditional obedience, <clears throat> teaching, confession, confession, preaching, and charitable work were the field of action of this were the field of action of this new order. But foreign missions were not excluded, as in fifteen forty one. Francis Xavier and two companions left Lipson to go evangelize the Far East. 
1546, the political side of their career was launched when the Pope chose Lands and Salmeron to represent him at the Council of Trent in the capacity of pontifical theologians. Mr. Bohemer writes, Then the order was employed by the Pope only on a temporary basis, but it performed its functions with so much promptitude and zeal that, already under Paul III, it had implanted itself very firmly into all chosen kinds of activities and won the confidence of the cura for all time. This confidence was fully justified. The Jesuits and Lands, in particular, together with their devoted friend Cardinal Monroe, became the cunning and untiring champions of pontifical authority and intangibly of the dogma during the three sessions of that council ending in 1562. Papal infallibility. That's what they're talking about. The Jesuits were the ones that came up with the papal infallibility. The, the main doctrine. <clears throat> By their clever maneuvers and dialects, they succeeded in defeating the opposition and all heretics Claims including marriage of priests, communion with the two elements, use of the vernacular in services, and especially reform of the papacy, which was in truth the goal of the reformers. <clears throat> Only the reform of converts was retained on the agenda. Lance himself, by a forceful counterattack, upheld pontifical infallibility, which was promulgated three centuries later by the Vatican Council. The Holy See emerged strengthened from the crisis where it nearly foundered, thanks to the steadfast actions of the Jesuits. The term chosen by Paul III to describe this new order in his Bull of Authorization were, the, were then amply justified Regimen Ecclesiastic Militants. The fighting spirit developed more and more as time went on, as beside foreign missions, the activities of Loyola's, Loyola's sons started to concentrate on the souls of men, especially amongst ruling classes. We're going to see that in the Secreto Monita. Politics are their main field of action. Did you get that? The Jesuits. Politics are their main field of action. As all the efforts of these directors concentrate on one aim. The submission of the world to the papacy. And to attain this, the heads must be conquered first. And to realize this idea, two very important weapons, to be the confessors of the mighty and those in high places and the education of their children. In that way, the present will be safe while the future is prepared. Yeah, the Jesuits have been preparing for this for centuries. And it's starting to come to fruition. Let's continue. The Holy See soon realized the strength of this new order. The Holy See soon realized the strength this new order would bring. At first, the number of its members had been limited to 60. But this restriction was promptly lifted. When Ignatius died in 1556, his sons were working amongst pagans in India, China, Japan, the New World, but also and especially in Europe, France, southern and western Germany, where they fought against the heresy in Spain, Portugal, Italy, and even England. 
getting in by the way of Ireland. Their history, full of vic vicissitudes, will be of a Roman network. They will constantly try to spread over the world, whose links will be forever torn and mended. So see, the Jesuits' main goal is to be involved in politics. So they can prepare the future. Educate the kids and be the confessors, the spiritual heads. Ta-da! Look around you, Church of the Living God. Now, chapter 4, the spirit of the order. Pay attention. <clears throat> Let us not forget, writes the Jesuit Roquette, that historically, ultramontanism has been the practical affirmation of universalism. This necessary universalism will be an empty word if it did not result in the practical cohesion or obedience of Christianity. Like 2,700 um, evangelicals saying to take the vaccine. Yeah, Jesuits. This is why Ignatius wanted this team to be at the disposition of the Pope and be the champion of Catholic Unity. <laughs> yeah. Unity which can be assured only through an effective submission to Christ's vicar, the Pope. The Jesuits wanted to impose this monarchical of absolutism on the Roman Church, and they maintained it in civil society, as they had to look upon the sovereigns as temporal representatives of the Holy Father, True head of Christianity. <coughs> yeah, like I warned you in the previous video. Good, I'm feeling some heavy congestion coming up. Alright. As long as these monarchs were entirely docile to their common lord, the Jesuits were their most faithful supporters. On the other hand, if these princes rebelled, they found in the Jesuits their worst enemies. That's why some out there who are half in, half out, wouldn't dare cross the Jesuits, because they are the most powerful military organization on this earth. And the black Pope Sosa is the most powerful man on earth. In Europe, Wherever Rome's interests required the people to rise against their king, or if these temporal princes had taken decisions embarrassing for the church, are you listening? The cura knew she would not find more able, cunning, or daring outside the society of Jesus. When it came to intrigue, Propaganda, or even open rebellion. Let me read that to you again. In Europe, whenever Rome's interests required the people to rise against their king, or if these temporal princes had taken decisions embarrassing for the church, the cura knew she would not find more able cunning or daring outside the society of Jesus when it came to intrigue, propaganda, propaganda, thank you pardon, or even open rebellion. Look at the news. Look at the open rebellion taught against our Lord Jesus Christ, our God, our Father, and the scriptures by these pagans. By these Satanists. Continuing, we have seen through the spirit of the exercises, the spiritual exercises, the basis for the modern mind control, and also which uh, where NLP stems from, 
which also is something that is employed within the military, at least here in America. Let's continue. We have seen through the spirit of the exercises how the founder of this company was behind his time in his simplistic mysticism, ecclesiastic discipline, and, generally speaking, his conception of subordination. The constitutions and exercises fundamentals to this system leave us without any doubts on that subject. No matter what his disciples may say, especially today as modern ideas on this subject are totally different, obedience has a very special place. In fact, incontestably, the first in the summary of the order's rules. Obey. Obedience to the head of the order the Jesuit order, the black pope. Not to the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, our Father. Not to the scriptures, to the black pope. Mr. Follet may pretend to see in it nothing more than religious obedience necessary to any congregation. R.P. Roquette writes boldly, far from being a diminu diminution of man. This intelligent and willing obedience is the height of freedom. <laughs> a liberation from one, a liberation from oneself's bondage. Yeah, because you have someone else doing your thinking for you. A man of Satan, the black pope, or the or the provincial of the order, whatever um, unit is out there, like on YouTube. Uh, these Jesuits on YouTube, they don't answer, to, they are not self-thinkers. They are answering to a head who is their provincial on YouTube. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Take your part. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't think I've, you don't think the Lord didn't show me that? Give me a break. <coughs> One only has to read those texts to perceive the extreme. Exactly, and I have. If not monstrous character of the submission of soul and spirit imposed to the Jesuits, making them always docile instruments in their superiors' hands, and even more from their very beginning, the natural enemies of any kind of liberty. That's why the Jesuits' Catholicism hated the, and still do hate the uh, U.S. Constitution, which they have successfully made nothing more than a laughing stock. The famous Perndi ek Cadaver, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, the famous Perndi ek Cadaver, as a corpse in the undertaker's hand can be found in all spiritual literature, according to Mr. Follet. And even in the East, in the Hashishin's constitutions, constitution, the Jesuits are to be in the hands of their superiors as a staff obeying every impulse, as a ball of wax which can be shaped and stretched in any direction, as a small crucifix being lifted and moved at will, these pleasant formulas are none the less very enlightening. Yeah, again, here on YouTube, these Jesuits and these coadjutors, they're not thinking on their own. Someone else is thinking for them. They're getting orders from their provincials, okay? They are not self-thinkers. They do not think, all right, because they don't adhere to to the scriptures. They don't have God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, living within them. They have the Antichrist spirit living within them. And they are taking orders from their provincials. The provincial is the head of a unit. Okay? Uh, the, wait, wait, where'd that, where'd that go? Where'd that go? Okay? Here's the unit of the Jesuits here on YouTube. And they are in subunits. Okay? Here's that unit and here's their provincial. Their provincial tells that unit to do. The uh, individual Jesuit within that unit does not act on their own accord, only what their provincial tells them to go and do. 
Okay? Okay? And that provincial gets his stuff from the top. Probably from Sosa himself. I would not be surprised. Okay? Okay? You get that? We have to understand that. What we're dealing with here. We are not dealing with rational, sane men. Let's continue. Remarks and explanations from the creator of this order leave us without any doubt as to their true meaning. Besides, amongst the Jesuits, not only the will, but also reasoning and even moral scruple must be sacrificed to the primordial virtue of obedience, which is, according to Borgia, the strongest rampart of society. But also reasoning and even moral scruple. There is no such thing as a disobedient Jesuit. And if one disobeys, like Alberto Rivera, who they killed eventually because Alberto Rivera went to a dentist and he even said that that dentist killed him, Okay, that's why I ain't going to no Jesuit dentist. Okay, but even when a Jesuit gets out and is set free by the gospel of Christ, the time is numbered. Look at Alberto Rivera. I rest my case. Let's continue. Let us be convinced that all is well and right when the superior commands it when the superior commands it the black pope sosa or the jesuit provincial on youtube of how many units is under that provincial okay wrote loyola and again even if god gave you an animal without sense for master you will not hesitate to obey him a, as master and God, because God ordained it to be so. And something even better. The Jesuit must see in his superior, not a fallible man, but Christ himself. J. Huber, professor of Catholic theology in Munich, and author of one of the most important works on the Jesuits, wrote, here is a proven fact. The Constitutions repeat 500 times that one must see Christ in the person of the General. The discipline of the Order, assimilated so often to that of the Army, is then nothing compared to the reality. Let's read this again. And something even better. The Jesuit must see in his superior not a fallible man but Christ himself. J. Huber, professor of Catholic theology in Munich and author of one of the most important works on the Jesuits, wrote, here is a proven fact. The constitutions, the constitutions of the Jesuits, repeat 500 times that one must see Christ in the person of the general. The discipline of the order, assimilated so often to that of the army, is then nothing compared to the reality. You're a Jesuit, Jesuit coadjutor. You don't serve the real God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. God to you is the general, Sosa, or your superior, your superior, your provincial, who goes to Sosa. You are to see him as Christ, says right there. We're also going to see it echoed in the Bible to the Catholic, too. I pity you guys. I really do. You're disgusting. See, we are the Church of the Living God. <laughs> we serve the true God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we adhere to His Word. The authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures, the true and real scriptures, which you Jesuits and Catholics hate. Uh, you're, you're King James Christian, huh? 
<laughs> you're a Jesuit and you're pathetic. How does it feel to not be able to think for yourself? Disgusting. Let's continue. Military obedience is not the equivalent of Jesuitic obedience. The latter is more extensive as it gets hold of the whole man and is not satisfied like the other, like in the Marines or something like that, with an exterior act, but requires the sacrifice of the will and laying aside of one's own judgment. See, the Lord doesn't want us to be robots. We are to think in accordance with the scriptures. The Jesuits have someone else doing that thinking. The only thinking they do is what their superior gives them the allotment to do. And what they come up with is nothing but evil. Look at Fauci. Look at the people who are advising Trump. Ignatius wrote in his letter to the Portuguese Jesuits, We must see black as white if the church says so. So, and that that is echoed in the Catholic Bible. The Catechism, okay? The Catechism of the Catholic Church. That is echoed. Ignatius wrote in his letter to the Portuguese Jesuits, We must see black as white if the church says so. So, if the Pope or the provincial says, Thou shalt kill if thou feel like it, when the scriptures say otherwise, they go with what their provincial says. Not with the scriptures, obviously. Right? Such is this height of freedom and liberation from one's own bondage, praised earlier on by R.P. Roquette. Indeed, the Jesuit is truly liberated from himself as he is totally subject to his masters. Any doubt or scruple would be imputed to him as sin. That's why when you have a Jesuit who can't control his foul mouth and is given over to temper, is usually on the lower rung of the Jesuit order. And that is proven historically. Let's continue. Mr. Bo Bohemer wrote, In the additions to the constitutions, the superiors are advised to command the novices, as God did with Abraham, things apparently criminal to prove them. But they must proportion these temptations to each one's strength. It is not difficult to imagine what could be the result of such an education. <laughs> Hello! Look at today, people! Look at today, okay? The order's life of ups and downs. It was not expelled from one single country, testifies that these dangers were recognized by all governments, even most Catholics. Even by most Catholics. By introducing men so blindly devoted to their cause, to teaching among the higher classes, the company champion of universalism the company our CIA Catholics in Action is also referred to as the company and Yale or Harvard is the main breeding ground skull and bones for the Catholics in Action the CIA Therefore, ultramonetism was recognized as a threat to civil authority, as the activity of the order, 
by the mere fact of their vocation, turned more and more towards politics. Hello, people. In a parallel way, what we call the Jesuitic spirit was, de was developing amongst its members. Still, the founder, inspired mainly by the needs of foreign and home missions, had not neglected skillfulness. He wrote in his Sentinente Aceteque, I'm mispronouncing that, thank you, pardon. A clever carefulness together with a mediocre purity is better than a greater holiness uh, coupled with a less perfect skillfulness. That's contrary to scripture itself. Better is much, uh, I forget how it is, better is much righteousness than great revenues without right. I just paraphrased and butchered that, beg your pardon, go find it, but totally contrary to scripture. A good shepherd of souls must know how to ignore many things and pretend not to understand them. Pretend not to understand them. Once he is master of the will, he will be able wisely to lead his students wherever he may choose. People are entirely absorbed by passing interests. Isn't that the truth? Uh, the Athenians did nothing else but to inquire and to learn of some new thing, right? So we must not speak to them too pointedly about their souls. It would be throwing the hook without the bait. Even the desired countenance of Loyola's sons was empathetically stated. They must hold their heads slightly down without bending it to the left or right. They must not look up. And when they speak to someone, they are not to look them straight in the eyes so as to see them only indirectly. Eye contact. Loyola's successors retained this lesson well in their memory and applied it very extensively in the pursuit of their plans. Yeah, eye contact. Um, any of you who have met me personally or have talked with me personally, um, you know that, I'm a, that I look you in the eye. And I want you to look me in the eye. Now, reading from, you know, Lord, I, I apologize, Lord. Let me put this over here. I was defiling your word by putting this filth on there. I beg your pardon. Now, reading from the Catholic Bible. The Catholic Bible. We are going to be looking at... In the Catholic Bible, page 252, on to 258, okay? We are going to be reading from right here down, and this whole page, pause it and read it, take a screenshot of it. And Brother Matthew Green... Go ahead and put the link in the uh, description or in the comment section uh, for for the catechism if you want to. Okay. We're also going to be reading all this in its entirety. Pause it and read it and take a screenshot of it. Zoom in if you want to. Uh, yeah, I've studied your system, Catholic. And to write here on this page. Pause it and read it. Alright? This is the Bible to the Catholic. Alright. Now, remember what we read? We. Remember what we read? <clears throat> Page 
Here, in the spirit of the order, the Jesuit must see in his superior, not a fallible man, but Christ himself. Okay? The superior is their God. Not God himself. Not God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Reading from the Catholic Bible. The hierarchical constitution of the church. Why the ecclesia, ecclesial ministry? Christ is himself the source of ministry in the church. The yeah, Antichrist from Catholic. He instituted the church. He gave her authority and mission, orientation and goal. In order to shepherd the people of God and to increase its numbers without cease, Christ the Lord set, set up his church a variety set up in his church a variety of offices which aim at the good of the whole body. <laughs> yeah. The holders of the of office who are invested with a sacred power are in fact dedicated to promoting the interests of their brethren, so that all who belong to the people of God may attain to salvation. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? That's a quote from Romans, chapter uh, 10, verse 14. And how are they to hear without a preacher? And how can men preach unless they are sent? No, no one, no individual, and no community can proclaim the gospel to himself. Faith comes from what is heard. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. No one can give himself the mandate and the mission to proclaim the gospel. The one sent by the Lord does not speak and act on his own authority, but by virtue of Christ's authority, not as a member of the community, but speaking to it in the name of Christ. No one can bestow grace on himself. It must be given and offered. This fact presupposes ministers of grace authorized and empowered by Christ. From him, bishops and priests receive the mission and faculty. And I got a video, uh, video exposing this uh, myself, uh, uh, who forgives sins, okay? So continue. The sacred power to act in persona Christi Capitis, Capitis being another Christ, Deacons receive the strength to serve the people of God in the deconia of liturgy, word and charity, in communion with the bishop and his presbytrate. The ministry in which Christ's emissaries do and give by God's grace what they cannot do and give by their own powers is called a sacrament by the church's tradition. <laughs> Indeed, the mystery of the church is confirmed by a special sacrament. Intris intrinsically linked to the sacramental nature of ecclesiastical of ecclesial ministry is its character as service. Entirely in entirely dependent on Christ who gives mission and authority. Ministers are truly slaves of Christ. Of Christ. No, we are servants of Christ, not slaves. The, the Lord is not holding a gun to your head forcing you to do anything. Neither is the devil pointing a gun at your head forcing you to do anything. You're not being forced, Church of the Living God, and you Christians, you're not being forced. You're not a slave. You're not a robot. Let's continue. In the image of him who freely took 
the form of a slave for us because the word and grace of which they are ministers are not their own but are given to them by Christ for the sake of others they must freely become the slaves of all likewise it belongs to the sacramental nature of the ecclesial ministry that it have a collegial, collegial character in fact from the beginning of his ministry the Lord Jesus instituted instituted the twelve as the seeds of the new Israel and the beginning of the sacred hierarchy chapter and verse well, we're built off the apostles and prophets yes but see how these people twist the scripture chosen together they were also sent out together and their fraternal unity would be at the service of the fraternal communion of all the faithful they would reflect and witness to the communion to the communion of the divine persons <clears throat> for this reason every bishop exercises his, his ministry from within the Episcopal College in communion with the Bishop of Rome the successor of St. Peter and head of the college so also priests exercise their ministry from within the Presbyterium of the diocese under the direction of their bishop now note what we uh, read uh, what we looked at in the secret history of the Jesuits they don't think for themselves Let's continue. Finally, it belongs to the sacramental nature of the ecclesial ministry that it have a personal character. Although Christ's ministers act in communion with one another, they also always act in a personal way. Each one is called personally. You follow me. In order to be a personal witness within the common mission, to bear personal responsibility before him who gives the mission acting in his person and for other persons I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit I absolve you heresy heresy uh, who forgives sins I addressed this in that video who forgives sins let's continue Sacramental ministry in the church, then, is a service exercise in the name of Christ. It has a personal character and a collegial form. This is evidenced by the bonds between the Episcopal College and its head, the successor of St. Peter, and in the relationship between the bishop's pastoral responsibility for his particular church and the common soul solicitude of the Episcopal College for the Universal Church when Christ instituted the twelve he constituted them in the form of a college or permanent assembly at the head of which he placed Peter chosen from among them just as by the Lord's institution St. Peter and the rest of the Apostles constitute a single apostolic college so in like fashion the Roman pontiff Peter's successor and the bishops the successors of the Apostles are related with and united to one another also um, I have a video uh, Peter uh, first Pope or something like that where I dress that myself See, you balance their Bible off of the scriptures, and straight away you'll be like, uh, wait, wait a second, something don't line up here. <clears throat> the Lord made Shimon alone, who, was, who he named Peter the rock of his church. <clears throat> he gave him the keys of his church 
and instituted him shepherd of the whole flock. The office of binding and losing, which was given to Peter, was also assigned to the college of apostles united to its head. This pastoral office of Peter and the other apostles belongs to the church's very foundation, and it is continued by the bishops under the primacy of the Pope. Like I said, I'm going to link a few videos in this one. The Pope, Bishop of Rome and Peter's successor, is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity both of the bishops and the whole company of the faithful. For the Roman Pontiff, by reason of his office as Vicar of Christ, God on earth, you know, that's what the Catholic the Jesuit teaches and as pastor of the entire church has full supreme and universal power over the whole church a power which he can exert which he can always exercise unhindered the Jesuit must see in his superior not a fallible man but Christ himself. <clears throat> Let's continue. The college or body of bishops has no authority unless united with the Roman pontiff, Peter's successor, as its head. As such, this college has supreme and full authority over the universal church. But this power cannot be exercised without the agreement of the Roman pontiff. The College of Bishops exercises power over the universal church in a solemn manner in an ecumenical council. But there never is an ecumenical council which is not confirmed or at least recognized as such by Peter's successor. This college, insofar as it is composed of many members, is the expression of the variety and university and universality of the people of God, and the unity of the flock of Christ, insofar as it is assembled under one head. And they are talking about the Pope, not Jesus Christ, God our Father. The individual bishops are the visible source and foundation of unity in their own particular churches. As such, they exercise their pastoral office over the portion of the people of God assigned to them, assisted by priests and deacons. But as a member of the Episcopal College, each bishop shares in the concern for all the churches. Isn't that lovely? The bishops exercise this care first by ruling well their own churches as portions of the universal church and so contributing to the welfare of the whole mystical body, which from another point of view is a corporate body of churches. They extend it especially to the poor, to those persecuted for the faith, as well as to missionaries who are working throughout the world. Neighboring particular churches who share the same culture from ecclesiastical provinces or larger groupings called patriarchs, par patriarchates, or regions. The bishops of these groupings can meet in snods or provincial councils. In like fashion, the Episcopal conferences at the present time are in a position to contribute in many and fruitful ways to the, cons to the concrete realization of the collegic spirit. Bishops with priests as co-workers have as their first task to preach the gospel of God to all men.
keeping with the Lord's command, they are heralds of faith who draw, who draw new disciples to Christ. They are our authentic teachers, yeah, of the apostolic faith, endowed with the authority of Christ, yeah, endowed with the authority of the Antichrist, yeah. In order to preserve the church in the purity of the faith handed on by the apostles, Christ, who is the truth, will to confer on her a share in his own infallibility, heresy. By a supernatural sense of faith, the people of God, under the guidance of the church's living magisterium, unfailingly, unfailingly adhere to this faith. The mission of the magisterium is linked to the divine nature of the covenant established by God with his people in Christ. In this magisterium's task to preserve God's people from deviations and defections and to guarantee them the objective possibility of professing the true faith without error. Thus, the pastoral duty of the magisterium is aimed at seeing to it that the people of God abides in the truth that liberates to fulfill the service. Christ endowed the church's shepherds with the charism, charism of infallibility in matters of faith and morals. Infallibility. The exercise of this charism takes several forms. The Roman pontiff, the Pope, head of the College of Bishops, enjoys this infallibility in virtue of his office, when as supreme pastor and teacher of all the faithful, who confirms his brethren in the faith, he proclaims by a distinctive act a doctrine pertaining to faith or morals. The infallibility promised to the church is also present in the body of bishops when, together with Peter's successor, they exercise the supreme magisterium, above all in an ecumenical council, when the church through its supreme magisterium pro uh, proposes a doctrine for belief as being divinely revealed, and as the teaching of Christ, the definitions must be adhered to with the obedience of faith. Do you get that? See, the Jesuit, when they receive an order that comes from God himself, who they see as their superior, not the actual God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you get it? Ignatius taught his people to see him as God. And that has bled in to the Catholic Church throughout now. Who is God to the Catholic? The Pope. And if the Pope says something that is in, that contradicts the Scriptures, then they go with the Pope. The Catholic is loyal not to our Lord Jesus Christ, not to the Scriptures, but to the Pope, just like the Jesuit. <clears throat> All right. This infallibility extends as far as the deposit of divine revelation itself. Divine revelation. Um, no scripture is um, according to private interpretation. I just paraphrase that and butcher that. Make your pardon. Everything that is to be revealed for us to is given to us in the scriptures. In the scriptures. There is no added revelation. The scriptures are complete. We don't need the Pope. My goodness. Let's continue. 
Divine assistance is also given to the successors of the apostles. Teaching in communion with the successor of Peter, and in a particular way, to the bishop of Rome, pastor of the whole church, when, without arriving at an infallible definition, and without pronunciation, and without pronouncing, pronouncing in a definitive manner, they propose in the exercise of the ordinary magisterium a teaching that leads to better understanding of revelation in matters of faith and morals. Yeah, because they don't have the Spirit, and the Lord is that Spirit. To this ordinary teaching, the faithful are to adhere to it with religious assent, which, through distinct, which though distinct from the assent of faith, is nonetheless an extension of it. The bishop is the steward of the grace of the supreme priesthood, especially in the Eucharist, which he offers personally or whose offering he assures through the priests, his co-workers. The Eucharist is the center of the life of the particular church. The bishop and priests sanctify the church by their prayer and work, by their ministry of the word and of the sacraments. They sanctify her by their example. <laughs> yeah. Not as domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Not lording it over them. See how they twist scripture. Thus, together with the flock entrusted to them, they may attain to eternal life. Attain to eternal life. See, if you're saved and born again, you have eternal life with our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father. These bozos are working for their salvation and they don't have assurance of salvation. And if you adhere to Roman Catholicism uh, as, <laughs> as your way to heaven, you're going to hell. The bishops, as vicars and legates of Christ, govern the particular churches assigned to them by their councils, exhortations, and example, but over and above that also by the authority and sacred power, which indeed they ought to exercise so as to edify in the spirit of service, which is that of their master. And yeah, see here? Who's their master? Yeah. The power which they exercise personally in the name of Christ is proper, ordinary, and immediate although its exercise is ultimately controlled by the supreme authority of the church. <laughs> but the bishops should not be thought of as vicars of the Pope. His ordinary and immediate authority over the whole church does not annul, but on the contrary confirms and defends that of the bishops. Their authority must be exercised in communion with the whole church under the guidance of the Pope. The Good Shepherd ought to be the model and form of the Bishop's pastoral office, conscious of his own weaknesses. The Bishop can have compassion for those who are ignorant and erring. He should not refuse to listen to his subjects, whose welfare he promotes, as of his very own children. The faithful should be closely attached to the bishop of the church, to the bishop as the church is to Jesus Christ, and as Jesus Christ is to the Father. Jesus Christ is the Father. Let all follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows his Father, and the college of presbyters as the apostles. Respect the deacons as you do God's law. Let no one do anything concerning the church in separation from the bishop. Obey your provincials as God himself. Well, that's what the scriptures teaches. Uh, no. 
The scriptures teach that we are to adhere to the scriptures. And he who teaches through the scriptures are accountable unto the body of Christ. Okay? That's what the scriptures teach. Okay? Now, I'm going to be reading from the Sacrita Monita. Now, my wife is due home here. Uh, it's almost one o'clock. My wife is due home. I will probably pause this and go into the bedroom to finish this. Because we're, we're going to get through this. <laughs> we're going to get through this. But I do have a copy of the Secreta Bonita on my channel. In the About section. Go and download it. We are going to read Chapter 1. Chapter 2. And Chapter 3. In the Secreta Monita. Okay? You can get this on my channel. Download it and uh, follow me along. Now you're going to notice the one on my channel. That is the one that is actually in the British Museum. This one is not. There are differences between versions of the Secreta Monita. But they do teach the same thing about the Jesuits. Hold your... Uh, Hold your, uh, hold on one second. All right, I moved, uh, moved everything into here to the bedroom for when my wife comes home. So, reading from the Secreta Monita, chapter one on to verse on to chapter three. The manner of procedure with which the society must be conducted when considering the commencing of a some foundation. Now, you remember how we looked in the um, Bible to the Catholic the Catechism that everything goes through their provincials, their this guy, this guy, this guy, and they are to see their rulers as Christ. Here's how they operate. To capture the will of the inhabitants of, this, of a country, it is very important to manifest the intent of the society in the manner prescribed in the regulations in which it is said that the company must labor with such ardor and force for the salvation of their neighbor as for themselves. The company. And remember, the CIA here in America is also referred to as the company, taken from the Jesuits. <laughs> For the better inducement of this idea, the most opportunely that we practice the most humble offices, visiting the poor, the afflicted, and the imprisoned, it is very convenient to confess with much promptness and to hear the confessions, showing indifference without teasing the penitents. For this, the most noble inhabitants will admire our fathers and esteem them, for the great charity they have for all, and the novelty of the subject. To have in mind that it is necessary to ask with religious modesty the means for exercising the duties of the society, and that it is needful pro to procure and acquire benevolence, principally of the secular ecclesiastics and of persons of authority, that may be conceived necessary. When called to go to the most distant places where alms are to be received, they are to be accepted, no matter how small they may be, after having marked out the necessity of ourselves. Notwithstanding, it will be very convenient at the moment to give those alms to the poor for the edification of those who do not have an exact understanding of the company. And, but we must in advance be more liberal with ourselves. <laughs> oh, you filthy Jesuits. Mm. All must labor as if we were inspired by the same spirit, 
yeah, the Antichrist spirit. And each must study to acquire the same styles. Look here on YouTube. These guys who attack the brethren, they don't teach, they don't preach, all they do is attack, attack, and attack, and attack. That's it. They don't give, um, they don't reason from the scriptures because there is no life in them. See. Let's continue. With the object of uniformity among so great a number of persons, edifying the whole, those who do not contrary, those who do the contrary must be expelled as pernicious. In the beginning, it is not convenient to purchase property, but in case they can be found, some good sites may be bought, saying that they are to be are to belong to other persons. Using the names of some faithful friends who will guard the secret, guarding secrets, yeah. The better to make our poverty apparent. The property nearest our colleges must belong to colleges the most distant, that we can prevent the princes and magistrates from ever knowing that the income of the society has a fixed point, <laughs> yeah. We must not ourselves go out to reside to form colleges, except to the rich cities. For in this we must imitate Christ. And I have a whole video on imitate Christ myself. I might put it in this one too. <laughs> Actually, I will. Who remained in Jerusalem, and as he alone passed by the less considerable populations. We must obtain and acquire of the widows all the money that we can, presenting ourselves at repeated times to their sight, to their sight our extreme necessity. The superior over each provenance is the one to whom we must account with certainty, the income of the same, but the amount of the treasurer at Rome, it is and must always be an impenetrable mystery. How much they actually got must not be really known except amongst themselves, is what he's there saying there. It is for us to preach and say in all parts and in all conversations that we have come to teach the young and aid the people. And this without interest is any single species and without exception of persons, and that we are not so onerous to the people as other religious orders. And as you heard in the uh, secret history of the Jesuits, it was about politics and educating the youth. Yeah, and look what they have done. Beg your pardon. Let's continue. Chapter 2. The manner with which the fathers of the society must conduct themselves to acquire and preserve the familiarity of princes, magistrate, of magnates, excuse me, and powerful and rich persons. It is necessary to do all that is possible to gain completely the attentions and affections of princes and persons of the most consideration. For that, who being on the outside, but in advance, all of them will be constituted our defenders. Get a load of that one. As we have learned by experience that princes and potentates are generally inclined to the favor of the ecclesiastics when these disseminate their odious actions, and when they give an interpretation that they favor as is to be noted among the married, contract with their relations or allies, or in other similar things, assembling much with them, to animate those who may be found in this case, saying to them that we confide in the assurance of the exemptions that by intervention of us fathers, 
which the Pope will concede if he is made to see the causes, and will present other examples of similar things, exhibiting at the same time the sentiments that we favor, under the pretext of the common good. <laughs> And the greater glory of God, that is the ab object of the society. Ad majorium the glorium. Yeah, yeah. And their God, of course, is Lucifer, Satan. It is at this same assembly the princes treats the prince treats of doing something. Wait. It is at ad. Beg your pardon. If at this same assembly, the prince treats of doing something that will not be agreeable to all the great men for which we are to stir up and investigate, meanwhile counseling others to conform with the prince without ever descending to treat of particular uh, particularities, for fear there may not be a successful issue of the matter for which the company will be imputed and will be imputed blame. And for this, if the action shall be disproved, dis disapproved, there will be adv adverti advertisements presented, presented. There will be advertences presented to the contrary that may be absolutely prohibited and put in jeopardy. The Hegelian dialect, controlling both sides of the equation. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, synthesis, beg your pardon, <laughs> tripping on my own tongue. You control both sides of the argument to control the outcome. That is the Hegelian principle. And I wonder where Hegel got that from. Right here. In chapter 2, there number 3, right there. Okay? Where is that? Starts here and ends where my finger is. Okay? Like I said, you can download the uh, PDF for this on my channel, so do so. Okay? The authority of some of the fathers, of whom it can be said with certainty, that they have not had notice of the secret instructions. For that it can be affirmed with an oath that the culmine of the to the society is not true in respect to that which is imputed to it. To gain the goodwill of princes, it will be very convenient to insinuate with skill, and for third persons that we fathers are a means to discharge honorable and favorable duties in the courts of other kings and princes, and more than anyone else in that of the Pope. By this means, we, are, we can recommend ourselves and the society. For the same, no one must be charged with this commission, but the most zealous persons and well-versed in our institute. Aiming especially to bring over the will of the fa favorites of princes and of their servants by means of presents and pious offers, uh, offices, that they may give faithful notice to us fathers of the character and inclinations of the princes and great men. Of this manner, the society can gain with, fa uh, with facility as much to one as to others. The experience we have had has made us acquainted with the many advantages that have been taken by the society of its intervention in the marriages of the House of Austria <coughs> and of those which have been effected in other kingdoms, France, Poland, and in various duchesses. For as much assembling, proposing, with prudence, selecting choice persons who may be friends and families of the relatives and of the friends of the society, 
It will be easy to gain the princes, making use of their valets. By that, coming to feed and nourish with relations of friendship. By being located at the entrance in all parts, and thus become acquainted with the most intimate secrets of the familiars. Think about that in forms of our government here in America. Many spies for the Jesuit order are all over the place. And those who are in authority are either Jesuits, Jesuit trained, or being fed in the ears by the Jesuits. What is happening today, what the Jesuits do, they are living up to right here in chapter 2 in poisoning the governments and controlling the governments. They're fulfilling what they say here in the Secreta Monita. Okay? Do you get it? Let's continue. In regards to the direction of the consciences of great men, we confessors must follow the writers who concede the greater liberty of conscience. The contrary of this is to appear too religious, for that they will deceive, decide to leave others and submit entirely to our direction and counsels. Get a load of that. Get a load of that. It is necessary to make reference to all the merits of the society, to the princes and prelates, and to as many as can lend much aid to the society. After having shown the transcendency of its great privileges, also it will be useful to demonstrate with prudence and skill such ample power which the society has, to absolve even to the reserved cases compared with that of other pastors and priests, also that of dispensing with the fasts, and of the rights which they must ask and pay in the, in, in the impediments of marriage, by which means many persons will recur, will recur to us, more uh, will recur to us, beg your pardon, whom it will be our duty to make agreeable, are you getting a load of this? It is not the less useful to invite them to our sermons, assemblies, heronages, declamations, etc., composing odes in their honor, dedicating liter literary works of con uh, literary works or conclusions, and if we can for the future give dinners and greetings of divers modes. It will be very convenient to take to our care the reconciliation of the great in the quarrels and enmities that divide them. Then by this method we can e enter little by little into the acquaintance of their most intimate friends and secrets. And we can serve ourselves to that party which will be most in favor of that which we present. If there should be someone at the service of a monarch or prince, and he were an enemy of our society, it is necessary to procure well for ourselves better than for others, making him a friend, employing promises, favors, and advances, which shall be in proportion to the same monarch or prince. No one shall recommend to a prince anyone, nor make advances to any who have gone out from us, being outside of our company, and in particular to those who voluntarily verified, and in particular to those who voluntarily verified, for yet when they dissimulate, they will always maintain an inextinguishable hatred to the society. In fine, each one must proceed, must procure, and search for methods to increase the affection and favor of princes, of the powerful, and of the magistrates of each population, that whenever occasion is offered to support, we can do much with, effect, with efficacy and good faith, 
and be benefiting ourselves, though contrary to their relations, allies and friends. See, it's all about the glory of the society. They get in with the governors, with the rulers, with the presidents, with the kings, the queens, and that way manipulate them as if they were marionettes. You know, let me ask you something there, Church of the Living God. Thus far, is any of what we have looked at in accordance with the authorized version of the scriptures? No. No, it is not. No, it is not. Chapter 3. How the society must be conducted with the great authorities in the state. And in case they are not rich, we must lend our services to others. Yeah, get a load of that. You're going to like this one. You're going to like this one. The care consigned to us that we must do all that is possible for to conquer the great but it is also necessary to gain their favor to combat our enemies. Kind of like what they've done here in America. It is very conductive to value their authority, prudence and counsels, and induce them to despise wealth at the same time that we procure, gain, and employ those that can redeem the society. Tactically, valuing their names for acquisition of temporal goods if they inspire sufficient confidence. Valuing their names, like Bill Graham? Hmm? Like Kenneth Dopeland? You get the point? It is also necessary to employ the ascendant of the powerful to temper the malevolent, the malevolence, ah, beg your pardon, to temper the malevolence of the persons of a lower sphere and of the rabble against our society. It is necessary to utilize whenever we can the bishops, prelates, and other superior ecclesiastics, according to the diversity of reason and the inclination we manifest. In some points, it will be sufficient to obtain of the prelates and curates that which it is possible to do, that their subjects respect the society, and that obstructing the exercise of its functions among those who have the greatest power as in Germany, Poland, etc. It will be necessary to exhibit the most distinguished attentions for that, mediating its authority and that of the princes, monasteries, parishes, prior, prior, priorates, patronates, the foundations of churches and the pious places can come to our power. Because we can with more faculty, where the Catholics will be found mixed with heretics, it is necessary to make such prelates see the utility and merit that we have in all this, and that never will they have so much valuation, uh, valuation from the priests, friars, and from the future, and for the future from the faithful. If making these changes, it is necessary to publicly praise their zeal, although written, and to perpetuate the memory of their actions. For it is necessary to labor, and to, and for it is necessary to labor to the end that the prelates will place in the hands of us fathers as confessors and counselors. And if they aspire to more elevated positions in the court of Rome, we must unite in their favor 
and aid their pretensions with all our forces and by means of our influence. We must be watchful that when the bishops are instituting principal colleges and parochial churches, that the faculties are taken from the society and placed in both vicarious establishments with the charge of cures, and that the superior of the society to be, that all the governments, that all the government of these churches shall pertain to us. Let me read that again. That the, that, the, that the faculties are taken from the society and placed in both vicarious establishments with the charge of cures, and that the superior of the society to be, that all the government of these churches shall pertain to us, and that the parishioners shall be our subjects of the method that all can be placed in them, such as 2,700 ecumenical evangelicals telling you to take the vaccine. Their loyalty is not to God, our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Their loyalty is to the Vatican. Where they are, where there are those of the academics, of the academies, excuse me, who have been driven out from us and are contrary, where the Catholics or the heretics obstruct our installation, we will compound with the prelates and make ourselves the owners of the first cathedrals, for thus shall we make them to know the necessities of the society. Overall, we must be very certain to procure the protection and affection of the prelates of the church. For the cases of beatification or canonization of ourselves, in whose subjects convened, convened further to obtain letters from the powerful and of the princes, that the decisions may be promptly attained in the Catholic court. If it shall be accounted that the prelates or magnates should send commissioned representatives, we must put for, forth all ardor that no other priests who are in dispute with us shall be sent, for the reason that they shall not communicate their animadversion, animadversion discrediting us in the cities and provinces we inhabit, and that if they pass by other provinces and cities where there, where there are colleges, they will be received with affection and kindness and be so splendidly treated as a religious modesty will permit. Talk about gaining the favor of those, huh? And now, I'm going to read something to you from the Syllabus of Errors. The Syllabus of Errors is a list of, is a list of 80 dictates that the Catholic Church calls errors, obviously. But what I'm going to read you is errors having reference to modern liberalism. Right here, from here down, okay, this page right here. And this page right here to where my finger is. These are called errors by the Catholic Church, the Jesuits. 
and they still hold to these syllabus of errors today. Errors having reference to modern liberalism. In the present day, it is no longer expedient that the Catholic religion shall be held as the only religion of the state, to the exclusion of all other modes of worship. Meaning that they want Catholicism, radical Catholicism as the one world religion. They call it an error. In the present day, it is no longer expedient that the Catholic religion shall be held as the only religions, religion of the state, to the exclusion of all other modes of worship. Whence it has been wisely pro provided by law, in some countries called Catholic, that persons coming to reside therein shall enjoy the public exercise of their own worship. <laughs> they call that an error. Liberty of conscience. Free to worship whoever you want to worship. Now, we have that per se in America, but it's heading towards the one world religion, which is going to be radical Catholicism. Radical Jesuitism. They call that an error, which is in direct violation of the United States Constitution, which in itself is a guideline, not a dictate today. Moreover, it is false that the civil liberty of every mode of worship and the full power given to all of overtly and publicly manifesting their opinions and ideas of all kinds whatsoever conduce more easily to corrupt the morals and minds of the people and to prop and to the propagation of the pest of indifferentism. Get a load of that. Get a load of that. Let me reread that. Now remember, they're calling this an error. Okay? But listen to what they're listen to this. Moreover, it is false. That the, civil, that the civil liberty of every mode of worship and the full power given to all of overtly and publicly manifesting their opinions and ideas of all kinds whatsoever conduce more easily to corrupt the morals and minds of the people and to the propagation of the pest of indifferentism. Gotta love them Catholics, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself to agree with process, liberalism, and civilization as lately introduced. <laughs> no. They, uh, the Jesuits, Catholicism teach that the Pope has two swords, temporal and spiritual, that the Pope has the power to rule the whole earth, and that he ought to, and he has the power to put you into hell, spiritual, temporal and spiritual. <laughs> Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Extract from the final dogmatic decree of the Vatican Ecumenical Council of the Infallibility of the Pope. Mo knowing most fully that this see of Holy Peter remains ever free from all blemish of error, that the occasion of schism being removed the sacred council approving. We teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in discharge of the office of pastor and doctor of all Christians, by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine 
regarding faith or morals to be held by the universal church, by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter, is possessed of that infallibility with which the divine Redeemer willed that his church should be endowed for defining doctrine regarding faith or morals, and that therefore such definitions of the Roman pontiff are irreformable of themselves, and not from the consent of the church. But if anyone, which may God avert, presume to contradict this one definition, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. Given at Rome, in public session, solemnly held in the Vatican Basilica in the year of our Lord, 1870, on the 18th of July, in the 25th year of our pontificate. Eighteen seventy. One thousand eight hundred and seventy. So you see, brethren, right there, as we have also seen, that the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, that means from the chair. Is infallible and anything he says goes and like you just heard if the Pope were to speak something contrary to the true doctrines of Christ founded within the authorized version of the scripture the King James scripture the true and real scriptures then they go with the Pope see the Catholic is taught disloyalty from the very beginning they're loyal to the Pope and as we all know the Pope contradicts scripture all the time <laughs> so do the Jesuits <laughs> and now the black Pope Church of the Living God, you need to get this book, The Black Pope. I am going to be sharing with you just the highlighted sections of the Jesuit disloyalty teaching, okay? And what I'm going to be reading you is highlighted sections here. Pause it and read it. Pause it and read it and get a and zoom in. You know, take a screenshot. Pause it and read it. Get a screenshot. Zoom in. Pause it and read it. Get a screenshot and zoom in. Again. Pause it, read it. Screenshot, zoom in. Likewise. And that, and that will be that. Now, like I said, I am going to be reading to you only the things that I have highlighted in this uh, because we're coming on the two hour mark, okay? And I'm getting a little tired. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm going to read this opening article here. The object of the last chapter has been to show, from authority which cannot be disputed, the disloyal character of Roman Catholic teaching. Nothing can excuse it, and nothing can explain it away. But the Jesuits are necessarily and naturally the great exponents of this teaching. Hence, we now turn to their authorized books of theology. It was shown exclusively on Roman Catholics, on Roman Catholic authority, in the preceding chapter, that Roman Catholics are obliged to be disloyal. The government of the country in which they live may or may not Hold the same opinions as the uh, as the what as the what is best for the prosperity and peace of their native land as the Pope. The government of the country in which they live may or may not hold the same opinions as the what is best for the prosperity and peace of their native land as the Pope. But, whenever, but whatever may be the opinions of those who rule or decide public affairs, the opinion of the, post, of the Pope must be considered first and must be obeyed first. Many incidences might be given here of the inference of the Popes in politics, but one must suffice. It has chosen merely because it shows in what details this ecclesiastical pressure makes itself felt. And quote here um, highlighted that a Republican form of government is synonymous with the persecution and destruction of faith. Catholics are against a Republican form of government, obviously. Reading Highlighted stuff here on page 126. However, what, what, what was that? What is that? What is that? Big part. However, whenever Rome dilates on parental rights, she always means her own rights, for she recognizes no others. The teaching of the Jesuit must as we have said elsewhere, be always the same as the teaching of the church. The Jesuit therefore is obliged, whether he will or not, to teach this disloyalty. But the great evil is that the Jesuit always practices disloyalty and has opportunities which other priests and teachers have not of enforcing his dangerous doctrines. The Jesuit teaches them in his schools he teaches them in his colleges. He teaches them to his penitents, not the least important part of his work. Further, he publishes books in his country which teach this disloyalty, and then he comes before a too confiding public and declares that he is devoted, that he is a devoted Englishman, and would almost lay down his life in the service of his queen and country, he plots treason for the greater honor and glory of God. And he proclaims himself honest while he is practicing deceit of the worst kind. And all this is done in the sacred name of religion. Look at the YouTube Jesuits and coadjutors. Look at them. <laughs> I gotta read this. The Jesuits have their own printing press, their own composite, com, composite compositors, their own compositors, excuse me, their own workmen. They can print what they please and do what they please because this is a free country. But surely it is carrying liberty rather far to allow such license for such a purpose. Yeah. Skipping now 
two highlighted sections. Are heretics to be tolerated? With regard to heretics, two elements are to be considered, one element on their side and the other on the part of the church. On the side, on their side is the sin whereby they have deserved, not only to be separated from the church by excommunication, but also to be banished from the world by death. For example, I believe and teach the uh, See, Brother Matthew, I believe and teach the scriptural Godhead, that God is spirit, soul, and body, one God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. By that alone, and I have made myself plain on where I stand on the Trinity, I would be called a heretic and they would put me to death just like that. For it is much... Heavier, for it is a much heavier offense to corrupt the faith, whereby the life of the soul is sustained, than to tamper with the coinage, which is an aid to temporal life. Hence, if coiners or other male factors are at once handed over by secular princes to a just death, much more may heretics immediately, and much more, much more, May heretics immediately they are convinced, convicted of heresy, but not only excommunicated, but also justly done to die. <laughs> okay. But on the part of the church is mercy in view of the conversion of them that err, and therefore she does not condemn at once, but after the first and second admonition, as the apostle teaches, uh, Titus chapter 3 verse 10 they say. After that, however, if the man is still found per pertinacious, the church having no hope of his conversion, provides for the safety of others, cutting him off from the church by sentence of, of, of excommunication. And further, she leaves him to the secular power to be exterminated from the world by death. <clears throat> and reading a highlighted se uh, section, the Church of Rome still insists on her right to punish by corporal inflictions. And then talking about how the, um, the Catholics, the Jesuits, are pretty brazen about themselves. Um, certainly it cannot now be said that English Jesuits have deceived the English people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If our immediate descendants are done to die, either by civil war, stirred up by the Jesuits to win, win England from Rome, for Rome, or in the horrors of the Inquisition, presided over by the priests as it always has been, they can justly say, we told you this, why did you add to our power every day, socially and politically, until we were able to crush you? Think about that. Think about what power most nations have given openly onto the Jesuits. And look at how they're repaying everybody. <laughs> through their uh, Bible colleges and through the media. Hmm. Through the health organizations. Through the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Skipping and reading highlighted sections here on page 127. Indeed, Romanists seem to take a pride in declaring their contempt for the laws of the country, which has helped and sheltered them when they have been restrained and banished from countries once exclusively Roman Catholic. Neither in England nor in Ireland will the Catholics obey the law of Parliament. They have before them two things called law, 
which contradict each other. Both cannot be obeyed. One of them is the law of God. And the other is not a law at all. It pretends to be an act of parliament, but in direction of the legislation, it has no more value than a solemn enactment that the moon is made of green cheese. The law of God, that is the Pope's command, if carried into effect, the parliamental, parliamentary lie will be treated as all honest men treat a lie that is rigorously disobeyed, will be spit upon and trampled underfoot. Now see, the law of God, right here, which we, the Church of the Living God, adhere to. But see, they call the law of God what the Pope says. The law of God, found in the Scriptures, which we, are, as the Church of the Living God, are to live by faith and practice, okay? But see, to the Jesuit, to the Catholic, the law of God is what the Pope says. I like this. If we like the laws, we obey them. If not, we defy them. In the United States, the Jesuits are still more active, and all public organizations are at their mercy. Major Stoli, the apostolic delegate in the United States has promulgated, has promulgated an edict of the Pope, placing under the band of the Church as secret societies, the Odd Fellows, the Knights of Pythias, and the Sons of Templar, Temperance, December 21st, 1894. And uh, right here it says, A Jesuit scheme for the Romanizing of England. When, therefore, the Jesuit who writes on this subject declares that the scheme was not published for some time after it was written, because it was not safe to do so, we know that he refers to the necessity for concealing the conspiracy, not to the security of the conspirator, conspirators. Make your pardon, brethren. Okay, I'm back, brethren. My wife just came home with some really good news, so praise the Lord. Let's continue. <clears throat> Here on page 129, something to keep in mind. But Romanists in general, and the Jesuits in particular, have always a sharp eye on temporal affairs. And the weakness or indifference of Protestants too often affords them ample ground for concluding that if they ask with sufficient importunity, they will be sure to receive. Yeah. From all this it is evident that the greatest crimes in the eyes of the Jesuits were the honest marriages, marriage of a priest and the holding of money or land which the church claimed as her own. <laughs> yeah, it's all about the money. Here on page 130. For some years, the Jesuits have had their well-trained pupils in every department of state. <laughs> Hello, America. In the army, in the navy, in the parliament, or on the judicial bench. And it can scarcely be a matter of surprise that they have carried out the teaching of their masters. The foundation stone was to be the placing of a Catholic monarch on the throne, talking about England. Having had access to the original, we note two special points which the Jesuit writer in the month has thought, to pr to, has th has thought it prudent to pass by at least for the present. Father Parsons insists on securing a Roman Catholic king and still more on securing a Roman Catholic parliament and a Roman Catholic succession. Now in England they say that no Roman Catholic will ever sit on the throne. And there is some I skipped, so, but we're, we're just getting the, um, the uh, main details here. 
But this Elizabeth, she's a servant of the Pope, isn't she? Just like Trump is a puppet to the Vatican. Okay? <clears throat> that the king in no wise be better able to satisfy his duty to God and to assure his own possession and estate than by making account that the security of himself, his crown and successor, dependeth principally on the assurance and good establishment of the Catholic religion within his kingdom. Here in America, our elections are rigged. We do not vote people in. That's a scam. The Jesuits put in power who they want. Okay? The higher house is to be strengthened by the admission thereto of the principal men of the religious orders, a device, no doubt, for placing that august body under the control of the Jesuits. Hello, America. <laughs> Hello, CDC. Hello, media. Hello, um, the money. <laughs> Hello. Power should be given to the bishop of the diocese. Now I'm on page 131. To judge of their virtue and forwardness in religion and to confirm their election or to have a negative voice when cause should be offered. This is not all, for this Jesuit adds that these representatives shall be required to make public profession of their faith before their election could be admitted. He makes provision for, for instituting an inquiry as to all the rights and privileges taken from Parliament, since the entrance of heresy, which are to be restored by the Crown, and then he directs that every man be sworn to defend the Catholic Roman faith, and moreover, that it be made treason forever for any man to propose anything for change thereof or for the introduction of heresy, like following the scriptures. When Rome acts thus in her own interests, it is all right. But if Protestants protect themselves in a similar manner, it is bigotry and illiber illiberality. Get a load of that. <clears throat> Father Parsons then furnished instructions for the making of the laws by the Catholic Parliament, which he would establish, and first he proposes to abrogate and, and revoke all laws whatsoever have been made at any time or by any Prince of Parliament, directly or indirectly in prejudice of the Catholic Roman religion and to restore and to put in full authority again all old laws that ever were in use in England in favor of the same and against heresies and heretics. Do you, my American countrymen, remember what Trump said, that he was going to end Catholic bigotry? Hello? Hello? Jesuit trained... Donald Trump, and then you got Biden and his Jezebel vice president, who um, I got to, I'm going to say this to you, brethren. I thought that Trump was going to be reelected. We don't know whoever is worse for our nation is going to get the, who is going to, the Jesuits are going to put in. I believe it's going to be Biden. And then he's going to be proven incompetent, which he already is, and then America is going to have its first female president, who happens to be black, with the Black Lives Matter thing going on here in America and all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's just my opinion. Here is Father's, Father Parsons' idea of toleration. Check this out. To be provided that this toleration be only with such as live quietly and are desirous to be informed of the truth and do not teach and preach or seek to infect others. Oh, I'd be in danger. <laughs> For willful apostates or malicious persecutors or obstinate perverters of others, how they may be dealt with. This distinguished Jesuit states, it belongeth not to a man of my vocation to suggest, but rather to commend their state to Almighty God, and their treaty to the wisdom of such as shall be in authority in the commonwealth at the day, admonishing them only that as God doth not govern the whole that as God doth not govern the whole monarchy by but by rewards and chastisements, and that as he has had a sweet hand to cherish the well affected, so hath he a strong arm to bind the boisterous, stubborn, and rebellious, even so the very like, and same must be the proceeding of a perfect Catholic prince and commonwealth. And the nearer it goes to the imitation of God's government in this and all other points the better, and more exact, and more durable it is, and will ever be. The astute Jesuit suggests a military order for suppressing heretics. Are the Roma, are the ransomers the outcome of this suggestion? Now, now, you put that in context for today, brethren. Church of the Living God. We don't go ha ha social distancing. And we cannot receive that vaccine. We can't. The astute Jesuit suggests a military order for suppressing heretics. Oh, you're... Um, not thinking of the common good. You're rebellious. You're causing division within the country because you don't want to take the vaccine. Uh, in other words, according to the Jesuits, heretics. The Council of the Reformation was also to consider how some new order of knights, similar to the order of the Knights of St. John of Malta, might be erected in the realm for the exercise of the young gentlemen and nobility, whose rule should be to fight against heretics in whatever country they should be employed. And Father Parson adds, that whereas their ancestors to fight against infidels less dangerous and odious to God than these heretics <laughs> undertook long and perilous journeys into Asia and other countries. So the members of this new order should show their valor against heretics and enemies of God and his church. Of these are days, as well at home among us, as also in divers kingdoms round about us. Think, uh, think about what goes on here in YouTube. And I rest my case. Care was also to be taken for the expurgation of all heretical books. Public and private libraries are to be searched and examined for books. Also all bookbinders, stationers, and booksellers' shops, and all heretical books and pamphlets were utterly to be removed, burnt, suppressed, and serve order and severe order and punishment appointed for such as shall conceal these kinds of writings. Successive Protestant governments in this country have been wearied with 
applications and have used their best endeavors to relieve Roman Catholics from ever to relieve Roman Catholics from every possible religious or legal disability. But we learn from this memorial of Father Parsons that when the Roman Catholic power is restored, it is to be considered whether it shall be fit to disable some great and able heretics and their posterity, especially if they have been principal authors in the overthrowing of the Catholic religion, not only from priesthood and ecclesiastical dignities, but also from other honors and preferments temporal of the commonwealth for warning and deterring of others. Father Parsons also suggested in this memorial that in order to put commonwealth in joint again, it would be desirable to appoint a council of reformation. This council of reformation was to consist of certain prudent and zealous men put in authority by the Prince and Parliament and the Pope's Holiness, and for that the name of Inquisition may be somewhat odious and offensive at the beginning. Certain prudent and zealous men put in authority by the Princes and Parliament and the Pope's Holiness and for that the name of Inquisition may be somewhat odious and offensive at the beginning. Like the Inquisition that they are doing today here in America and over the entire globe or flat earth, whatever you prefer. But it, it is, but it is advised that before this council make an end of their office, when they have settled and secured the state of Catholic religion, it would be very much necessary that they should leave some good and sound manner of inquisition established for the conser conservation of that which they have planted. That perhaps it would be best to spare the name of inquisition at the first beginning, which is so new and green a state of religion as ours must needs be. After so many years of heresy, may, may chance offend and exasperate more than do good, but afterwards it will be necessary to bring it in, either by that or some other name, <laughs> as shall be thought more most convenient at that time. For that without this care, all will slide down and fall again. Did you get that? The Inquisition has not been abolished. Right now it's going on under the guise of for the common good. Do you get it? Do you get it, brethren, sisters? The memorial proceeds to the consideration of the form and manner of Inquisition, which it will be desirable to bring into this kingdom. The merits of the respective inquisitions set up in Spain, Italy, and Rome are severely discussed, and it is suggested that possibly a mixture of all will not be amiss for England when the day shall come. The prisons of the inquisition are also to be separated from the concourse of the people, like education, re-education camps. <laughs> and some sharp execution of justice is to be made upon the obstinate and remediless, like those of us of the Church of the Living God who will not take the vaccine. We are hearing a great deal at the present day of the liberality which we ought to extend to our Catholic brethren. <laughs> Yeah, our Catholic brethren. Um, look, if you're Catholic, you're not my brother. And I'm not yours. You understand? I'm not your brother. If you're a Catholic, I'm not your brother. And you're not mine. It would be well if we knew a little more of the kind of liberality which they propose to extend to us as soon as they have power. 
Get a load of this. Every concession to Catholics, whether that concession be small or great, is hastening the day when they can carry out the plan of which the Jesuits at the present day have so boldly and openly approved. Let us hear no more, then, of the Jesuits as the benefactors of mankind, as amiable gentlemen who merit our consideration. Let it be noted that we make no doubtful or calumnious charge against them. What we have advanced are stern facts, are stern facts, and facts which should sink deep into the heart of every reader. Nor can the matter be referenced to the past. Romanists are very anxious to persuade us that the age of persecution and intolerance has passed. <laughs> and it's true. Look at Vatican Council II. It has not passed. And those who say this know that well. Here's the proof that Rome is as intolerant, as narrow, as cruel, as determined to exterminate Englishmen. We do, we do to even use the word Protestants, as ever she was in the darkest ages of her dark career, if they do not accept her creed. And I've, I've read this quote before. The Jesuits must know that they, have, that they have hope of success, or they would never have made their plans public. It was a daring act, but they are daring men. They are daring men. The danger is that those who may have known such men should suppose that they are real representatives of the order or that they would dare to be anything else but cruel if they were commanded to be cruel. These men, if ordered by the church or by their ecclesiastical superiors, would not hesitate for one more moment to torture their nearest and dearest relatives or bring them to the stake, such is the power of religious fanaticism. Once more, let it be said, the fact is there, and there is no evading it. And there is no evading it. The Jesuits, they don't even trust themselves. They would turn on their own, and they have turned on their own. The Jesuits, the Catholics, one and the same, are loyal to the Pope. And they don't even trust themselves. They seek world domination and they seek the suppression of the truth. Whereas we, the Church of the Living God, are to adhere to the Scriptures by faith and practice, these bozos, their God is Satan. And you can never trust the Catholic brethren. Never trust a Catholic. One who is actively within their religion. You know, Alberto Rivera, he got out of it. And they killed him for it. So, brethren, that, uh, like, at the beginning of this video, I said we were going to read the whole chapter and we skim through it. I beg your pardon. It's almost two and a half hours. I think you get the point. Get this book, brethren. Get this book. This is along with the Secreta Monita. You want to know your enemy. Get this book. Well, brethren, I believe we, I have demonstrated to you through their, through their own writings, through their own things, um, that the Jesuits teach disloyalty, that the Catholics teach disloyalty. And their loyalty is to Satan. These are our enemies. These are whom we have to deal with. And these are who we are dealing with. We need to be aware of that. 
that you can't trust them. Your only, our only hope is that a Catholic will be broken and come to repentance and see the evil of their system and get out of it before it's too late. That is my prayer, that a Catholic will have their eyes open and get out of that system before it is too late. So, anyway, brethren, I have yet to upload the very first video. Um, I'm going to go um, start uploading these. It is 2.23 p.m. my time. I love you very much. I hope I hope this these two videos will help you. Uh, the Lord be glorified and that you are made a little bit more aware of how dangerous the Jesuits, i.e. Catholicism, truly is. I love you. And I'm going to go. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Okay?